Um, I'm going to call the order the uh, City Council Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee meeting at 5.02. the adoption of the agenda as indicated. I would it's second that. Version, it is version, it is 1026 version two, to be exact. I think we have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We have an agenda. Um, and then I'll entertain a motion on our 926 minutes. I will move the adoption of the minutes as uh, written. I would second that. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This moves us on to public forum. Um, do we have any members of the public? Andrea here in the room. Anybody else? Well, I guess maybe we'll start with. Start with you. Okay. Do you want me to join the table? You're certainly fine. Yeah. 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 Where's the best place? Where are we at? All right. <laughs> Front and side. Um, I, I wish I knew that this is for all the boots on the ground folks for the for the city we're meeting. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, I have two uh, things I want to make sure to say for public forum. One is about the bird bikes. Um, I've been emailing with the city and I'm, uh, as a bike advocate, um, wanting desperately to support the bird bikes, but at the moment not feeling like I can. Uh, the way that the, the, the rollout has been um, without adequate parking for the bikes and um, ADA blocking for the bikes has been really disappointing. Um, and I'm hoping I know they got, there's a memo. I'm hoping to learn from that memo more about what the plan is, but it feels like there's just some holes that haven't, their advanced planning for this was inadequate to match what we need for the city to be supporting this or for me to be supporting it. Um, so I'd love to see a, a concrete plan with the different partners that's addressing parking as well as blocking the places. Even just coming down here tonight, there's a there's one blocking the, the hut from the bus stop. Um, and so people can't, the wheelchairs or, or uh, parks and or uh, baby carriages and you can't get into those spaces and so it's just makes me sad when I see that um so I know you're working on it so thank you um and the other is um this time of year I always want there to be a clean sweep an operation clean sweep I've asked for this many years <laughs> um and I'm so glad that you're here because every time I ride over the, the grates, Megan, I think of you in, in the way that it's like a good way, in a good yeah. way, in a good way, which is I want these clear so that our waterways are clear as well as the bikeways. Of North, it's like such an infrastructure thing. And I, I just really, it, it kind of is a big head scratcher for why that hasn't been implemented. I know we've talked about this years and years we've, we've been talking about. And I, I feel like the answer that I get maybe has been labor, but I, I don't know if that's true still. <laughs> um, but um, especially if the agenda is water quality and safety on the agenda tonight, then um, please consider working the budget to include street sweeping the streets more regularly. I would personally like the streets to be swept the same way the plows plow the snow. That after a big snowstorm, the plows are plowing snow out of the way. And after the big rainstorms, which we know environmentally we're into more giant rainstorms, that those are that the the process is after the big rainstorm, the streets are swept um, to clear the silt and leaves and debris that land in our um, Greats and on also on the, the roadway. So those are my two wishes. <laughs> um, so thank you for the public forum and, and for what you all are doing for the city. My birthday is next week, so perhaps we could do a speak for my birthday. Uh, Halloween, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick update is we're going to be focusing on bird bikes a lot next month. So feel free to come back. We'll be bird will be here as will cat. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Where, your, where's the memo going to be? Sorry, that, that it's was... It's online uh, for already? the tooth meeting. I will send it to you right now. Thank you. So, yes, it, it should be with the agenda. I mean, yes. it's included in the agenda. Okay. So you can get it um, as part of that. And if you want to sit over here and enter, you can read it right here because it's like sitting right here. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other members of the public who want to speak online? There's no one else online. Okay. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and close the public forum and move to our deliberative agenda. And the first item is the uh, tertiary treatment pilot report, wastewater. Updates. It's like a multiple. Right. Is it, um, what, what, what's our time that we have? Seven years. Seven years to deliver this? Right. Um, I, there's no times on the agenda. Oh, um, okay. How long do you need? Well, it's just uh, how much detail you want us to go into, particularly on the renewal and upgrades. We are you know, trying to get the wave tops, but there is a lot of information. Um, I know we got the presentation to you a little late. I don't know if you had the chance to look at it or not, because that could inform how much we pause on certain slides. Um, this was the, um, the 748 page. Not so much that as the, uh, we did send you, I think, although it was only this morning, the draft slide deck, which okay. has a lot of material. Totally fine if you haven't gone through it. I just wanted to know, yeah. then that could. I mean, I think if we had, we could take 30 to 30 minutes. I think so. Enough we keep track. Yeah. Yep. And then it wasn't an official part of the presentation, but I was going to leave a little bit of time if you have, and I have some visuals, if you have any questions about how things are going with the board plant, um, sewer pipe second break. Great. You, know, you gave that this that presentation at um, MPA last night. Yeah. Were you on the? Oh, you were there. Okay. So you're. No, no, I'm good, but others might not be. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, I'm, and, and just so I got something from Maddie at 953 today, the main tertiary pilot program. Yep. I do not see. There was a forward, and maybe she ended up forwarding a link. Uh, I do not see any other communication from her, She's, nor do I see the link. She said it was part of the online packet. I think she put the. So, okay. So, yeah, I. I okay. I, that, I, that, that's that's so I haven't. The, the long and the short yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah. I have not either. So Okay, no problem. So we're going to spend a little time talking about tertiary treatment, which is a portion of what ultimately um, Martin will be talking to you about our overall larger um, facility upgrade and uh, yeah, facility both renewal and upgrade. You know, this is really one of the chief components of the upgrade part of our project and not just putting the three plants back the way that they currently are. So um, just going back a little bit, you know, tertiary treatment is a process that targets phosphorus removal um, from wastewater. Our wastewater plants already do really, really well for the type of technology that they have, um, which is secondary treatments. Um, but uh, as we know, the lake, it has a lot, uh, way too much phosphorus going into it. And then with climate change, warm when the stays, um, we're seeing these cyanobacteria flow. So in 2016, the state did a total maximum daily load of the lake and figured out exactly how much phosphorus Vermont needed to reduce in order to hopefully at least take care of the red part of that equation. There's not a ton that we can do about the blue part, but you know we gotta focus on what we can do, which is how do we reduce the amount of nutrients going into the lake? And so I've given presentations, I know at least to Mark in the past, I don't remember if you were there for the presentation we gave about our integrated water quality plan. Um, out of that team, DL Burlington had to look at getting phosphorus removal or phosphorus reductions on the stormwater side, the separate stormwater side and on the wastewater side. Um, there's a process that the EPA has uh, allowed for, which is to do integrated planning. They're starting to recognize that communities like ours have so many different regulatory obligations that we have to do at the same time, that it doesn't make sense to just do this piece of paper and this piece of paper and this piece of paper. Let's put all the pieces of paper together and figure out what the best combination is um, that will tackle the highest priority things in the right order. <clears throat> so as part of that process, we actually went through a whole big ginormous many year alternatives analysis where we looked at the impacts of 
doing sort of enhanced phosphorus removal at the wastewater treatment plant and how much how many pounds we could get from that and what it would cost. And that's the sort of sector, the, the first scenario versus on the far right side, the third scenario, which is, hey, is it even possible to get all of our phosphorus reductions via just stormwater? You all know, I love stormwater, I love stormwater management. There are a lot of cool benefits to doing stormwater things. Is it possible? The answer is, in theory, yes, it is feasible. Our target that we have to reduce overall in the city is about 1,100 pounds. You can see that a phosphorus-centric approach, sorry, a stormwater-centric approach, um, it is possible to get us above that 1,100. The problem with that is that it is more expensive and certainly has longer-term operation and maintenance costs. And a lot of the things that we were going to be leveraging are changes in human behavior, which we know is very, very hard to enforce and get compliance. Whereas on this, on the portfolio one side, we're really talking about capital investments, putting things at ends of pipes that we can measure and whatnot. So at the end of the day, due to cost and also the fact that portfolio one gives us a much needed buffer, um, so that 1100, that target of 1100 pounds is an average annual target. And as you all know, with the influence of the wet weather system at main plants, we go like this compared, you know, due to the weather, we can have big years where we put out more phosphorus, years where we put out less phosphorus. And so we actually need a bit of a buffer, more than a buffer than the stormwater alternative could provide. So portfolio one, which is adding tertiary treatment, gives us that buffer and is also overall less costly. And the difference between one and one B? I mean, I, one and one B is um, really the major difference is how much we sort of turn the dial um, on additional stormwater retrofit. So one is doing the sort of not the bare minimum, but doing just the regulatory requirements of stormwater, whereas one B is doing some more things. And we're still looking at those and still trying to figure out with the state how much of a buffer we need to make sure that we don't get into trouble at all. Um, with climate change and with the way that the, the plant. So it's, you know, this, is, this is sewage, this is wastewater and stormwater. This is, no, so this is, um, this is just on this lower level is all separate stormwater. Um, our obligations for combined sewer are in that red line. So we, we will have to, there's sort of no negotiating about what we have to do as far as our long-term control plan. We have a new 1272 order which lays out how much impervious we need to manage within the combined sewer system every single year for the next uh, 20 years. Um, the biggest project that we will be advancing in the near term is the Pine Street CSO storage tank, which we are planning on putting underneath Callahan Park. Uh, the CSO here is the most frequent CSO, the most voluminous, and so is the easiest place to, uh, to go. Um, the tank may be bigger than what we thought it was going to be in this scenario because of the hula development. So we are quickly recalculating, you know, making sure that we know how big that tank needs to be and what hula needs to do in order to make sure it's not going to be exacerbating that CSO condition. So because we, when we implement, um, this is just the, the target at 1100, approximately pound the target, and you can see with this, we would be meeting 235% of Burlington's annual average target. However, somebody would say, well, why are you why are you going above and beyond that? You don't have to do that well. And the fact is we do have to do that well because of those wet weather variability. So the next stage, once we realize tertiary is sort of where we think Burlington needs to put its money, um, is that we were, uh, worked with our consultant to do a pilot study and to evaluate the ability of selected technologies to go down to the limits of, of phosphorus removal technology, which is 0.1. Uh, currently, main plant average phosphorus uh, concentration discharge is about 0.28. So it's got to squeeze it pretty low. Um, and we wanted to evaluate those under a variety of conditions, not just when everything's happy and go lucky, which is what sort of the steady state is, but hydraulic stress. So that's when the plant sees those excess flows and then also solid stress. And solid, solid stress can happen when the process isn't quite so happy, right? There are times, days and times, things they dumped in our system where the system will release more solids than it's typical. And so we ran through all of those scenarios. And you're doing it on the, on the current load to the system. 
but you're all they were also were they also projecting i know that there's a lot of load to the breweries that we, you know from the breweries that we've got so um, yeah so that's all still there and we you know we've been working and generally uh directionally telling them like you're going to have to do more but nobody's substantially done more so we're sort of at our um uh we're sort of at the peak of what we think organic loading would be. There's a whole separate study and program that we're trying to develop for industrial pretreatment, which would actually work with both existing high strength dischargers as well as future high strength dischargers to make sure that they are implementing best management practices to get their um, strength of their waste down as low as possible, which will free up capacity. Um, at the, the integration with the solid um, stress. Um, it should live, it should help the number of times a year that we are having things like solid stress when they are due to high strength waste. There are other reasons why we can have solid burps. Um, a secondary goal, so not required, but we're trying to make sure that we could find additional buffer if necessary, was to evaluate the ability of those technologies to potentially reduce phosphorus during wet weather flow events. So tertiary is mostly targeting just the dry weather daily flow. But some technologies are also able to handle like this ramp up and this extra phosphorus that might hit um, during a wet weather event. So they went through a request for proposals. They um, found three different technologies, all of which had um, very different sort of approaches. Camera, Mark, did, were you able to do this? I did. I went down with yeah. Kirsten was giving this science, to science, it. Was really yeah, cool. geekiness. Um, so three different technologies, uh, Veolia, uh, yeah. It's hard to see, but Veolia um, is the active uh, uh, um, ballast inflocculation. So it gets the um, sand particles to stick to the sticky phosphorus particles and helps more of them settle out than usual. And then there's a whole process to sort of strip the sand off and then reuse it. Um, and then there was Nexum, which uses uh, I think it's activated uh, sort of reactive filtration. So it kind of supercharges the sand particles, coats the outside of them with chemicals so that those, those sand particles, instead of just physically filtering, are actually absorbing um, phosphorus onto it and holding on to more of it. And then they have a backwash process to kind of regenerate the sand. And then the simplest one on the far right is aqua aerobics, uh, which is really just a true physical, there is a chemical addition to get the particles to be bigger. But then it is a, a Mr. Coffee coffee filter where it is just simply filtering things out. And then there is a backwash for, uh, procedure to, it looks like shag carpet. Maybe it's a child of the 70s. That's why I like it. It's blue shag. Um, and it frees up those, those filtration sites by going through a backwash cycle. So the cool thing is all three technologies met that goal of achieving um, a average of less than 0.1 milligrams per liter during dry weather. However, aqua aerobics, Mr. Coffee uh, performed the best overall during the steady state, um, getting the lowest average. They were able to get down to 0 0.048 on average um, versus the other two, and it had the most consistent performance. It didn't do as well as I think the active flow during storm events, but it still did dang well, like well enough that if we need to go in that direction, it can still do that. So the graphic is the actual. Uh, you know the ability to during the storm events is on that is it it's not on it's not on this graph it's on the next graph i believe so on this graph you're seeing the influence uh total phosphorus that purple and then you're seeing the target of 0.1 and then the um uh, aqua aerobics is in green Veolia is in blue and nexum is in orange and you can see except for that first day when they were kind of optimizing um the disc filters were able to get down low and stay low Right, so that means for most of the year they're going to be kicking butt. Um, if you look at this, is just aqua aerobics, so stripping out the other ones, and you can see the different types of conditions: the steady state, the hydraulic stress, and then the steady state with that one peak, the vortex blend. Um, so the uh, influence is in blue with the solid circle and the effluent, that's all right, uh, influent, no, the influent TP is in green with the solid circle. And then the effluent uh, total phosphorus is with the uh, open circle. And then you see that limit again. So that line down on the bottom, right? It dives down, it stays down below 0.1, even with, during the steady state, during the hydraulic stress, and it goes above 
during the vortex, which is totally fine because the conditions are different, but it is still reducing the difference from that top peak to that low peak. It's still knocking it down substantially compared to where it would be. Um, they also happen to be the most cost-effective option if you do wade through the report, should you choose to do so. Um, you'll see from both a capital cost as well as a life cycle cost perspective. Do note that in the cost proposal, those numbers are very preliminary and they don't include the potential costs. The other outside costs of like pumping wastewater to the system, it's really just talking about the system itself. What would it cost to buy this thing and put it on site? And some of what um, Martin's working through with our other consultant is where are we putting it? How do we get water to it? All that fun stuff. Um, are there differences between the three in terms of those other inputs? That the other inputs? I don't. Um, we the assumption is well the the, thing, the sand filter one, which may like get to, is like the most expensive one. We kind of set, set that one aside, but when we compare the um, the filter one to the viola viola. Um, active flow of ballasted sand. Um, we assume that both of them would need to have probably a pump that goes from the end of the process. That's when it needs to get the tertiary tertiary filter. Um, there's a chance that it would be great by gravity if it could go through without an extra pump station, but we're given existing conditions. So we need to um, assume at this point in time that we do need a pump. For both of them. For both of them. Right. Same pump. I mean, um, yeah, it would be it would be the same in the same. Thing, yeah, you'd be same grabbing time. it. You'd be grabbing it after the secondary clarifiers, um, and before yeah, it would be second. It's not. It's before we just go this, yeah, yeah, because it'll help a little bit with disinfection. It's going to make the water that much cleaner. Um, but yeah, we're assuming right now, and certainly keep, we'll be keeping an eye on that, making sure that those external costs would be roughly the same, and so that we really can be looking at the cost of these things. So even though the number I think in the report is like nine, nine million or something, the cost of pumping and pump stations can be significant. So rough right now we're using like a $20 million number as a conservative estimate um, for what this would cost. Um, and so it will be part, and I'm gonna hand over to Martin in a second. One of the things that's important when we talk with the community, you know, this is going to enable us to meet our TMDL obligation and meet it relatively quickly rather than taking 20 years, right? In the next five years, boom, we did it. We took care of our phosphorus obligation. The challenge is the lake is a bathtub and phosphorus is still coming down the Winooski. As much phosphorus came down the Winooski in the flood as in all of 2022. And so it doesn't mean that we're not going to have cyanobacteria blooms. And we have to wrestle with that because I wish I could sell this by saying, hey, if you give me this much money, beaches are going to be open. Um, and that's just not a truthful statement. So any any questions on that piece? Um, in, the, in the numbers, um, they, they said with a 30% contingency, the cloth media one was 75, 7 million. Um, oh, so 7.5. Yeah, I think the other ones were 9. Okay. Yeah, but then the additional cost. So that's an old older number with all the inflation. And then with the pumping, we hope it's going to be less than the 20 million, but that's sort of what we're holding as we go forward and talking about the big, big, big project. I guess the other question I had was, is there other money that's available for this through, like... I would say that I have in the last, I don't know, however many years I continue and I will continue to put in congressional delegation requests for if they're not going to pay for the big thing, because a lot of times the amount of money that's available for uh, renewing aging infrastructure, that's not as sexy as some of the other things that are, the money is going to uh Either, even from the Biden infrastructure bill is a very small amount compared to the overall need in Vermont. Um, but I'm hopeful that we may be able to sell like this particular phosphorus piece to somebody who wants to have their name on a, on a building. Health or something. You know, under Lake Health, which was a big exactly. lady initiative. Yeah. Yes, no, that is why I have sent it to him many, many times and I hope that, you know, New folks will be willing to listen, especially as we get more meat on the bones, right? Yeah, especially, but, I'm sorry, no. It's, there used to be grant money available. In the 1990s, there was specific grants for phosphorus removal, and they took those away. 
Yeah. But lake, lake wise, I think if I remember from the previous presentation on this, we're like 11% of, yeah. yes. of the problem. Yes. Um, whereas the rest of the, uh, you know, the agricultural sector and some of the other uh, stressors on the lake uh, are putting in the rest. So we're spending, you know, nine or $20 million to do, take 11% out. Yep. I mean, I think we have to do it by statute, right? But, yeah, there's no there's no getting out of it. And I think our other selling point is that this is something we can do, do soon, and, you right. know, like get the process started, get the leak. Hopefully, because it's going to take many, many years, even if the phosphorus faucet gets turned off, it's going to take a long, long time for the lake to rebalance. And, but the general funding mechanisms for these are bonding as revenue bonds and rates. And well, in the rates to pay the. Uh, yeah. And so we, we have the capacity because they're revenue bonds. So not yes. Not, it's not generally. We are not limited revenue. by yeah. the, yeah. So the we, bond. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, um, um, so I, I mean, it's actually not directly related to this, so we can just take this, you know, just make a comment about it, but the heat that is generated at our plants um, and the methane that's uh, generated, um, I will be very curious to know what we are doing with both of those sources of potential energy right now and the, um, you know, and, and any thinking that people have had about the, the future and its use in the uh, the big world that we've got around uh, reducing the carbon. Yeah, so we participated with the ED and the district energy proposal early on and looked at a few things at wastewater that we were really excited about, but unfortunately did not beat out the McNeil option. Which no, I, 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 oh. I, I don't need you to like make a long presentation longer, but I do. Ah, so I, good at that, though. I know you are. That's it's why I'm signing <laughs> talking about it. And I am, I am, I'm I am equally, and I am equally <laughs> as good. At it, so I'm trying, but I, this is a, as a flag, this is, this, this is, a, I want to flag this as a, an essential conversation to have. And um, if we can have it and get information about that, even outside of a meeting, it would be in a short. That it, it would be even even if it were a special session or it was something that staff did well. Okay. Anyway, thank you. I'd thank be you. happy to talk about that. I would love it. Yes, I would love it. Okay. So we're going to keep it up given the timing of all the other stuff. You know, so the next part of the presentation is talking about this big renewal and upgrade project and, you know, what, just refreshing everybody's memory, because they're like, wait, I thought you got $30 million, I thought that's all you needed, right? And I, I certainly tried throughout all that to say this is not all that we're going to need, this is the first part. Um, I think what we ultimately needed was probably even more than when I was saying those statements, because what happened is, in, in late 2020, once we got the upgrade of those failed systems, the disinfection and the SCADA system under their way, underway and under construction, Martin and his team started being like, okay, now let's go back to that list. Let's go back to how much money we have remaining um, in the, the Clean Water Resiliency Plan and make sure that those cost estimates were good, redo those cost estimates, and then also make sure that the remaining money was truly spent on the high priority items. And when we started looking at that, and our um, engineer had kind of done a pretty simple risk calculation. Um, certainly in 2018, you can see we had systems that were already uh, failed or about to fail. And after we spend the money, the many money on those, we're obviously moving things out of the F category, but we still have a lot of stuff in the C and the D. And with every year that we go, more stuff that was in the A and the B moves further down into the lower categories. And so when we started to look at, well, even after we've spent this money that the Motors gave us in 2018, what is our risk score gonna look like? And we're seeing, we still got a lot of stuff in C, D and, 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 and uh, F. And so what we started to see is that the number of systems and the replacement cost for the remaining higher systems was so much significantly higher than the remaining bond money. Um, and we really were sort of had to come to this reckoning that we really needed to do this comprehensive process. We couldn't just do this piece and this piece and this piece. We needed to hit this pause button, look at it big picture, and figure out the slide puzzle of everything moving. 
And ultimately, you know, our message is that we believe that Burlington deserves both resilient wastewater treatment systems where the risks of failure are as minimized as possible. And then we need to make sure that these are modern systems. We need to make sure that we are doing the absolute best on environmental quality, that they are resilient against flooding and other natural disasters, that we are addressing potential capacity issues, especially now in this last year where the growth the chains that were maybe holding back growth have been released, which is not something that we were necessarily thinking of before. Um, there's a lot of safety issues. Our workers are in challenging work conditions. They're in places that are not adequately ventilated and, they, and the needed investment to make those safe is really hard. And then the last piece is, we know the plant is not beautiful smelling. Where are the places that we could make some investments that would make it more consistent and more compatible with the things that are going on in the waterfront? And with that, I will pass it on to Martin, my engineering manager. Great. Thanks, Megan, for doing the beginning of the presentation. Um, so the work that we currently have money for through our 2018 Clean Water Resiliency Bond is stage zero. Um, and we are in preliminary engineering for stages one and two. And then we also have stage three on the radar. So these are all what we see as um, important needs for our wastewater treatment facilities. And I'll just jump into uh, the next slide, which um, stage one at a time. So it's stage zero. Um, again, we have funding for this. It's under this final design right now, which is 2023 to 2024, construction is in uh, 24 to 26, and the cost estimate is currently $12.8 million, and this is what we call the Headworks upgrade. Um, so the basically the, the reason for this improvement is doing work on facilities that need to get done no matter what the future um, you know, whether we get bonding or what the future forecast is, this equipment needs to get replaced. It's at the end of its useful life. It's at the beginning of the treatment train. It removes solids, um, grease, and big sediment from the wastewater stream, which protects downstream equipment and makes the process more efficient. Uh, so this, these oh, are, sorry, sorry the, I was just pointing out the black boxes around the areas of the main plant where that's occurring. Um, and then the other two plants, so this is at all three plants. The east plant is on Riverside Ave, and that's what we are showing on the left. The yellow highlight is around the building where the headworks is there. And at the north plant, at the end of North Ave, um, that's the building too. The, those are, facilities are actually very similar design, so they have similar upgrades planned at those two smaller plants. Um, and so just to kind of quick highlights of some of the falling apart infrastructure that would be touched for stage zero, we have some um, gates in the Headworks building at main plant on the left um, in disrepair there. In the middle, we have uh, screening equipment. Uh, the upper pictures actually are screened completely taken apart and being worked on. That was six months ago or so. Um, and the bottom is just, you can see half the dumpster was, has been patched together with welded metal because it's all corroded. Similarly on the right, just there's a lot of patches, broken equipment that is going to be repaired as part of this project. And one, one risk that we're facing right now is our Mr. P, our guy who is the MacGyver of these plants, it is retiring in the next six months to a year. So, if anybody's good at welding, wants to come. Say hi to Steve. Um, so, stage one, um, as well as stage two, is what we would be planning to go to for bond in November 2024. Um, stage one is in preliminary engineering phase right now with design in 2024 um, to 2025 construction would be planned in 2025 to 27. And this is the big cost one, the biggest cost one, I should say, at $121 million. So this one is not just 
um, like a lot of the other ones, replacing aging equipment, modernizing, making things safer and better, but it also includes significant upgrades at main plant. Um, and the reason that we're doing upgrades is to increase capacity. There's a few reasons. And the biggest driver for increasing capacity is bringing the east plant, um, all the flows from this plant over to the main plant. So basically turning it into a pump station and bringing it over here, that, that saves over a 50 year lifespan looking at it that saves significant money and it um the big driver for looking at that was the disrepair that was um that is going on with the equipment and infrastructure at east plant um and so there's there's some plant would no longer function as a wastewater treatment plant it would function as a pump station so stuff would still go there and then it would get pumped to main plant over sort of consolidating our resources because Burlington's pretty small to have three plants and to have to upgrade three plants every 20 years, that's a long-term cost. I, I think the last time they did the upgrade, our understanding is that they did look at this, and for whatever reason, we can't figure out exactly why it fell off the plate. Other when was that? The 1991. 1991, because it already was a $52 million Probably. The greatest, so that's, largest uh, plant. Right, so I think that may have been the case, because it is going to cost us now a little bit more money, but if you look out over time, it will save the ratepayers time and it will ultimately get better water quality because we're going to be investing tertiary treatment and better treatment here. Consolidating, not consolidating staff, we think we'll probably need the same number of staff, but we'll be able to have them focus on one plant instead of the two plants. And so we get we have another slide later. We want to talk more about that. But yeah, no, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, I think I, I think it's important here to understand why we're increasing it is because we're bringing East Plate over. And so the other piece of that is that we have a permitted flow value at the main plant, and then we would be adding on the permitted flow value from the east plant. And at the main plant currently, we're you know getting close to the limit of the permit. At east plant, we have more space, maybe more than 50% of the flow there is still available within the permit. So that value. That's an important thing. We're not going to throw that away. Bring flows here. We're never going to throw away what we have permitted because that's uh, not only valuable, it'll add to the capacity here, which brings um, flex not it, it adds flexibility to where growth will happen in the system and kind of takes some of that fear away of like, uh, okay, if someone's developing downtown or if they're in the East Plain watershed, sewer shed. It's all going to the same place where the plant is now larger and able to handle it. And the permits can be adjusted to increase without. They can be additive, they right? Can, if okay. we were going to go for an overall increase, so if, if say we weren't doing this, but we're like, look, there's going to be more growth in the main plant, we're going to build a better plant to increase capacity and then go through the process where we get our permit limit increase. That is that is challenging, and that may happen to have to happen. Someday in the future, when you know, like Burlington is full of 15 story buildings, but like we believe this combination is going to be appropriate for this next 20 year pattern. Does that make sense? And again, we're already going to be getting a lot of phosphorus removal from the stuff that's coming to main plant by bringing the east plant over. Then we're also going to be getting even more phosphorus pounds above and beyond sort of what we have to get. Um, we're going to be having better water quality. So, yeah, and so the, the big tanks. Um, kind of show there's two things in Perkins Pier area. There's the circle in the up, upper portion that's a, clear, a new fifth secondary clarifier. Um, and there's also tankage in the parking lot in Perkins Pier in there, which is aeration um, tanks, a placeholder for what we would need there because we're also going to be adding um, equalization tanks and tertiary equipment. So the exact location of where those, all those new structures are going um, is kind of a black box that we're, we're putting there. We know it could fit in there, we just don't know exactly all the locations at this point. Um, and so in the parking lot, that would mean that you would reduce the size of the parking lot to, and increase the size of the wastewater. 
Yes, and interestingly, the Perkins Pier, you may recall this, used to be park. It what used to oh, be yeah. wastewater land. And when it was conveyed to parks, thank goodness somebody did an MOU that we have a copy of that says if wastewater ever needed it back, that technically we have rights. Obviously, we are collaborating and coordinating with our partners at Park and Rec <coughs> to see how this all goes and make sure it's the minimal impact because it is a waterfront use thing. Do you know if this was anticipated in the Perkins Fear Master Plan? It was. It was. Yeah. Well, we were on the committee then. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we just know. I didn't remember the wastewater part of that. They didn't put it on there, but what they did is they made sure that they weren't programming buildings there. Okay. That the only thing they were going to program there was parking, so that it would be talking about something like parking removal, which is still going to be an issue for them, but we weren't talking about having them having to move an entire building. And the bike path? Just want to thank yeah. Parks for being a cooperative yep. player on this. This is not an easy conversation. I feel for them, and they've been good players in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so the bike path, which runs right now in between there through the city, that would uh, yes. If there's a tunnel, we're going to go underneath. That no, it's like a plastic tunnel. We go through. As long as you can see, it's You're not on the windows. This is the new the new bike path. Uh, it's route does not the include. So that goes, it doesn't go through there anymore. It doesn't go through there anymore. It's only on this on this outside it's edge, the lakefront side. Ask your project. Yeah. Okay. But part of the conversation with parks <laughs> is to figure out with our plan how the more permanent reroute of the bike path. Currently, the reroute for Perkins is temporary. They want to see what we need, then we can work with them, figure out what the permanent path is. Yeah. But the bulk of the path is staying the same, and we're accommodating. Okay. And hopefully it's going to be slightly better smelling because the yeah. Yeah, so that uh, before we move on the last um, improvement that is, is something that's not there currently is covers and odor control on these primary tanks the two ones that we have there um, that is probably the biggest source of odor that's still remaining on site. It wouldn't be a complete elimination of odor at our facility, but um, significant improvement. Better than us just printing, you know, the air, which is our current yep. thing. Reduce it, I <laughs> guess. Um, so here are some photo, quick photos again of uh, items that we'll be touching. Uh, for stage one, uh, clarifier mechanism in the upper left, those are corroded and need replacement. We have busted electrical in the lower left corner. We're doing major electrical upgrades. Uh, the aeration tank here, various photos of cracks and um, uh, valves that are, have holes in it. And then we have a pump on the right with holes in it there as a, a big influence pump. Um, stage two. Uh, this is also um, what we're proposing for uh, 2024 November Bonfo. Um, this is the East Plant Pump Station Conversion Project, as well as highest priority items at North Wastewater Treatment Facility. It's currently in the preliminary engineering phase. Uh, design would be scheduled for 25 to 26, with construction starting in 26 to 28. And the cost estimate is $38 billion. Um, so I, th I think we covered most of the um, kind of reasons and benefits of bringing the East Plant over, but this shows, um, you know, we would be putting in a new pipe essentially from the East Plant on Riverside Ave um, all the way down to Battery Street and the main plant. So it's, it's a significant right of way project, and that's where. A lot of the cost it is, as well as with the new pump station equipment at the East Plant. Whether you do it now or, or later, the uh, the impact on travel. Did we did we did have a a paving of Riverside? I can't remember. Mm, it has you know, probably been paved recently. We we yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, we've done. That's what I thought. We've and done our absolute best to try to coordinate things with paving, but the thing they just don't line up sometimes, and they don't line up. I so mean, we don't, yeah, we don't Riverside has held up better than others, but honestly, V Trans is paved on about an eleven-year average of the city. Okay. Um, 
And the route to get to, to Battery Street is what? Riverside to uh, Winooski to the north. So we're taking up Winooski again? It looks like yeah. Elmwood or Elmwood. Um, Archibald. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not north. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. One of the things that we're, you know, when and where we can. So one of the things we looked at because we have pipes that also need to be renewed is, you know, one method is to pump it up to the top of the gravity system and then let the gravity system take it. But we want to make sure we're not causing problems with existing neighborhoods or we already have some constrictions on Battery Street. So we don't know that we're going to be able to do that. We were hoping we could do that because then this project kind of tackles two issues with, with, one, with one project. Um, it is possible we're going to have to do a force main all the way to main plans to make sure we're keeping capacity within the existing pipe. So that's yeah, there's something. pros and cons with each option. I mean, there is a benefit to having a force main go all the way there. I, I mean, one of them is that we don't need to potentially uh, impact the 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 challenged water like collection system that's at the bottom of Maple and Battery. That's where there's a bottleneck, but your the bottleneck is because the elevate, you know, we have a lot of elevation constraints there. Uh, we have the lake and the um, yeah. right. So, so we, you know, it's like how to design that would be pretty complex potentially. Um, and then if we brought the force main into the plant, we could bypass the headworks initial yeah. build because the pump station will still have that screen for it. So the water that we're pumping doesn't have grit and big material in it. So we yeah. can put it right into uh, this. Uh, the next step in the treatment process. We're not double screening it. So we've already screened it. Why put it through the same system again at main plant, which is what would happen if we did it, put it to the gravity system. So they're looking at those. Right. Things. And you're aware of the scoping study for Battery Street? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the integration. Yep. Okay. Thanks to external sleeper. Been really good about hey we're gonna have this project going on like what do you have going on in the next five to ten years and then trying to can you hold the meeting interdepartmentally with the ed co as well as our two different groups and so yeah. parks is doing a brief design yeah. yes. they are also there um so this this is where the pump station um would live the everything to the upper part of the screen would be obsolete and demolished. We would keep the clarifiers in the building for the pump station. And um, that's just a kind of overview of what this plant would turn into. Go to the yeah. next slide. So um, also we have our north plant, which um, tends to do well, except for the siphon, but um, that, that plant does generally well, but we can't forget about its aging infrastructure because it does have significant improvements that are needed. So we just the highest priority ones for stage two um, is are what we would be focusing on. Uh, stage three, um, this one should be pretty quick, but it's so it's not in preliminary engineering, and we don't have currently a bond vote uh, schedule for it. Um, we would be planning to do preliminary engineering in 26 to 27, design in 27 to 28, and then construction in 28 to 29, and the cost estimate is $82 million. Um, next slide. So that we would be touching um, a lot of different spaces at the treatment plant. Basically, this is a, a project where we would be renewing old infrastructure, bringing it up to code, replacing obsolete equipment. And uh, one addition is another item in Perkins Pier. Again, this is to be determined the exact location, but it's a, um, a covered sludge storage tank to help improve our biosolids handling. Uh, yeah, and then, so similarly in North Plant for our next slide, it's touching all of the, the spaces there to do the remaining major pieces of equipment that need updates. Um, 
Yep. That's uh, yeah. Just some quick photos. These are the stage three items that you know we they are on the immediate future, but they are not doing that great. Even you know, pipes and pumps on the left in the middle there that are corroded, as well as heating equipment on the right. Just in case you didn't you know didn't believe us that things are breaking. Um, and then you know we haven't talked to you about all of the other things. Thank you, Martin. You know, but we're obviously looking at our sewage pump stations. We have twenty five pump stations. We've upgraded two of those. There's uh, I think uh, nine, seven to nine more that we need to tackle. I think we're a couple of them have come off the list because of some things we've been able to do in house. We're continuing to look at our collection system, so the system of sewer pipes. We've got stormwater infrastructure improvements. Number of outfalls that are in vast need of repair and potentially affecting slope stability, as well as the combined sewer overflow mitigation that I mentioned. And we can't forget drinking water. The uh, drinking water plant was last upgraded in 1984. Um, is doesn't have the same harsh condition that wastewater does, but also needs investment and likely modernization. Um, something that's coming sooner than even that uh, is the upgrade and replacement of the 1867 pump house. Um, up on Main Street, that's the pump, it's the house that holds the pumps, which takes the water from the reservoir and gets it up to the elevated tanks, which is what feeds the water pressure at the hospital, very critically important. Um, and there's also some improvements on the reservoir itself that's in need of a new roof to make sure that water remains uncontaminated. Uh, and then we need to continue chipping away at our system of very old water pipes and water valves in particular. So um, those are not included in the two hundred forty-one million nope. that you no 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 those numbers that we talked about are the wastewater plant, but it does include tertiary. So at least at least we didn't put that on the side. Um, you know, we've been talking about the last time, as as Gene noted, the last upgrade in the nineteen nineties was fifty-two million. Even just if you look at inflation and that number, I probably need to update with last year's inflation. Um, you know, it was about $100 million just for kind of replacement of things um, when we are doing these upgrades. And so that's where you're seeing this additional cost. Uh, I think, as you know, we're committed. We know, some of us live in Burlington, that this is going to fall to the rate payers and that this is going to be a significant increase to the rate. And so we actually had a meeting with PED today. We are trying to flip over every rock about how we can do even better on our affordability program, right? We got it started very incrementally with some of the lowest income folks and how how can we potentially extend that to folks who are upper lower income or lower middle income um, because there is going to be um, a, some pinch points with that. So just know that we are continuing that conversation and as we start to really talk with the community about these numbers and true numbers for bond votes, we're going to hopefully have either some Solutions already figured out, or at least solutions that we are working on um, that would be put in place before these rates would actually come into play. I had uh, questions around what you're like. So I understand that you want to bring a bond in November 24. That's currently what we're targeting is sort of when we think we would be ready, and that also we can't really wait longer than that because some of the stuff really needs to happen soon. When do you anticipate you want to come to the council for like a work session to basically give this information? That's to give a preview because we're talking about some really giant numbers bigger yep. than yes. high school that we just that yes. we're kind of struggle with. Yep. So we're right. not looking at one what one is it 121 or is it one 121 plus, plus 38. Yeah I mean we we thought we could decide as a community to take multiple bites. Um, we think that, or at least our initial cut of the proposal is to go for one and two at the same time because we're doing things in one that relate to what we would do in two. And if we're somehow not going to do two, then we could be thinking the whole enchilada. Um, I think the, there's compelling reason to have that initial work session in my mind during uh, prior to town meeting day so that the various folks who are discussing the future of Burlington and what so priority has have a full knowledge of this information because this is a major policy discussion. And so our interest is to get this moving quickly uh, to be discussed. Thank you. Happy to so what 
has been your conversations with seeing OSHA? We've had high level conversations about this uh, with her, with the administration, uh, the mayor as well. Uh, you know, there were discussions about trying to get this on town meeting day 2023, 2024. Uh, but <laughs> that was that was a couple months ago. <laughs> and where we are now is realizing that the size of this, frankly, our ability to hit all the key stakeholders and have a robust community discussion really requires us to be on November. And uh just to put it into context, are you aware of competing other departmental needs and what departments those might those might involve? Uh, we have been discussing preliminarily uh, with BED about some of their needs and interests, but I don't know if you're referring to something specific. Uh, no, I'm not. I, I I don't know. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I, I mean. I didn't know if, if there was this particular thing. No, I got not. I, I'm not bringing municipal no, waste. No. I, municipal solid waste collection will not be brought by me this coming time. We'll get that. <laughs> not right now. We'll fight that battle. With you. And, and those are general. Those are general fund things. Yes. Yes. Anyway, yeah. so this is it's different than it's it is. B E D obviously is a right. Right. revenue. Is relevant. The airport might be a, you know is a, is a revenue. Right. Uh, water and wastewater are two different. Yes, but it is, it is possible, what I'm trying to convey with that other slide, is that it is possible in November that we would be going for water and yes. wastewater. The, the water one would be much, much, much smaller, but still not small. It would be bigger than our $8 million one that we did. Because the um, reservoir alone, I think, is, I can't remember the price on that. It's okay. like 10, 12. Yeah. What would be? It would be separate. It would be, it would be separate. But it would be pitched as part of an overarching water. That's our thought. Yeah. We're welcome to hear your thoughts. It's on the same bill. It's on the same pair. So we yeah. think that the rate payers would prefer to understand the package instead of us coming in multiple different ways. I think that's right. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, earlier is better. And, so um, earlier, even if we don't have absolutely, I guess that's my tension. It's like I like to have everything figured out. I like to not talk about it until I have the affordability program. But I also think people need time to marinate in this. Yeah, I think definitely these are like we're talking about. Um, you know, even though it's revenue and everything to the resident who pays property tax, electric bills, water bills, it's all about. Portability and portability, so we just need to have that discussion. I right. echo that, but I, I and I think actually the most important thing when you're in that stage is to be very clear about the problem statement, to be uh, very clear about the potential benefits, and to have a little bit more. Um, in the affordability world to be able to talk to people about the uh, the way that people who are really stressed are going to be able to afford it. And yeah. I won't go on a soapbox, but you know, my socialist self has, you know, is not alone in the city in the way that the stratification is, uh, is affecting people and the housing costs. So yeah. very, very important. That to be, in, in fact, more important than whether it is 121 or 130. Yes. No, I, I don't disagree. I think it's hard because I haven't been work. I mean, other than the goal of affordability, you know, the being able to say exactly what the rate might be and therefore how much we have to do the affordability does tie into the cost. So that's where it's a little bit iterative. But I hear what you're saying and at least giving examples, uh, again, one of the cool things that came out of the conversation with BET today is that they had talked with Green Mountain Power and BGS who are using paying DCF to do their income verification. Because one of the things is right now, we're, our current affordability program leverages existing federal programs. So if somebody shows us proof that they qualified for fuel assistance, we give them a water discount. Um, 
But if we want to get into helping people who aren't on those programs, who still need help, how do we do that? Um, and, you know, I don't know if there's other city departments who are talking about affordability? Is there an opportunity to partner with other city departments? You and I have had that conversation before. But if there's not, I think you know we may just go ahead and lead the charge because we need to help people. And then um, the other piece is the renter piece. It's, it, it's structurally not we're not able to help them. And there's one example that I know of where a community, and it may be in a state where the electric utility is not regulated, like ours is where um, basically the water water resources gives money to the electric utility to offset their electric bill in an amount that would be equivalent that if they paid their water bill. So it's sort of like this pass through of helping the people directly versus giving the money to the landlord and having them adjust their rates and all. So there are some creative ideas, but they are few and far between. There's like that program and there's DC program and everybody else is struggling with the renter thing. Um, yeah. Yes. The more on that, the more that you can involve people like C. A. O. Shad, mm -hmm. more that you can raise the the problem, so that we can get good minds to um, to be thinking about its solution. The more that we could be reaching out to state agencies that may have good ideas um, and also. Folks like Public Assets Institute. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's they are good. Would be a good. Um, good move. I'm not trying to rush us. No, I'm no, no, trying no. to manage us. Um, how much time do you need for the sewer? Oh, do you want me to? Oh, okay. um, yeah, me, me, we can just go to. We'll skip to the second, the last slide. Yeah, no, I'm good with with continuing. If you think we're ready for go. Um, sure. I'm. Um, I would love, I love the idea that if there's some combined savings of a paving project and the rerouting, that I feel like as a great payer, I'm getting a bonus, a twofer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if that messaging comes to to us as well, and as an older, as an older offender, yeah. I'm really wanting to feel like we're giving you some attention, old North End, to the, to the things that have been neglected. Those are some messages I would love to hear, and I think like. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's a problem. I don't know why it's all so disturbed. Um, responding. Did, uh, your comment, Gene, was um, that you wanted to hear. I, I'm, I'm good with wherever you want to go. In terms um, of I know we have three more items. I'd like to get us out of here by seven. Or Let me be the. Can I give you the verbal? Absolutely. There's a pipe broken in the river. We all know that. We did a lot of really awesome things to build the temporary home station and keep sewage from going in the river. We are currently under construction um, and we're actually going back to the council, Board of Finance and City Council this coming week because there is already a change order because things already got more complicated, but we are fixing the pipe at least temporarily band-aid in the river to get us through the winter because we don't want to run the temporary pump station through the winter. We can, but we do not want to. Um, separately, we are, and that's FEMA eligible, at least at 75%, hopefully at 90, if the feds can get us the money because Vermont has met the threshold to reach the 90. Separately, we have uh, Stan Tech. We are working with them to develop a scope of work and sign a contract for the, how do we get the pipe out of the bottom of the river option. The two options being directionally drill, actually two pipes to be modern in this section or potentially getting the whole thing out of the river, building a permanent pump station and a force main to um to north plants on yes also and one of the cool parts with our meetings with fema is it does seem like that would be fema eligible i wasn't sure early on if they would be willing to fund the right thing but everything we're hearing from them makes it sound like they would fund something because that would also be a substantial cost particularly the force the force main part and if we do the direction drill part it would handle the crossings but it doesn't handle that long section that's in Colchester that at some point is going to be a problem, but it's in like wetlands and forests and I don't really want to dig up wetlands and forests. So that yeah, that's that's good. Okay. And I'll also pitch if anybody wants to a more detailed discussion of it, there was one at the board four seven NPA last night, last night. Which is recorded and available. And I got called sewer woman. 
So we're woman of the year. <laughs> Which is in my book, you know. That's the way. People think of me when they go over grades and they think of me when they do other things. Like <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions from the committee before we close this uh, this item? No. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's exciting and daunting what, what's ahead of us. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Team Water. Um, next Thanks. on our agenda are, is a uh, engineering standards, which I'm assuming. Yeah. So, is it all right, all right if I just start the introduction yeah. this bit? Please, yeah. Sure. So, as a city engineer, my kind of my first thing was really key first encounter was the fact that we have so many streets that are uh, unaccepted in, in, in in a state that really today we wouldn't accept in its full condition in large part because the, the, I don't think there's really standards that were holding people accountable to how the street should be built before it can even be considered to be dedicated and accepted. And uh, under the zoning process, there was looked like there was 1960s type standards, which no one was following and didn't make any sense. And I think in, in some step along the way, zoning had decided to abandon <laughs> those standards of practice and subdivisions and those sort of things, which were reasonable, but the city as, a, as an entity cannot afford to have a lack of standards in place to hold people accountable to these things because the experience has been to date, and I'm sure you all understand this, that a developer come down the street, it'll be built to some standard practice, there's been no inspection, and have to sit the various stakeholders that are prepared to take it over, are prepared to take it over because it's comes to the cost. It comes to the cost of the taxpayer, comes to the cost of the people who are living on the street who are part of that development process and are suffering from it. So um, when I talk about stakeholders, I'm talking about what works in the roadway, it works the sidewalk, fire department uh, in terms of fire access, parks department uh, in terms of their trees, all the utilities that normal to a street are water supply, sewer, storm, all those things. So we really want to get to a place where we have a framework that can be used to hold people accountable in the development process. Even if they're not anticipating to dedicate a street, we know at some point in time, because the street's built and people die and move on, that that street will likely be in our hands at some point, some day later. So we are wanting to hold them accountable to that at the front end and have to be clear about those standards. So there's no argument when we come time for a development review process, that is the way it's going to be. Uh, I would also say to you that as a city working within the framework of state and federal government, there's an expectation that we follow their standards and practices that they in some form are going to contribute as a partner in developing these systems. And they want to make sure that what they've invested in makes sense and is a solid engineering standard of practice. So whether it be VTrans grants or whether it be FEMA or hazard mitigation, we've as a city have elected to adopt those standards of practice, along with kind of overarching. What is our specific interest and needs that exceed that within our city? So, thankfully, members of my team have worked very hard to kind of carve out a process of creating structure to that process in terms of how it's organized, but also gathering up those details that are specific to that. And Julia and uh, Maddie and Laura have been working very diligently to. Not just capture what is above ground on the street, but working with some of our water streets resource people to kind of pull it in when they are busy, we're busy. But this is a good starting point to what will be a framework of information that can be used to, to do what I just talked about. And without a question, you don't know, expect that we've got all those standards of practice established in this these uh, specifications, but I think it's a great start and uh Julia and Nora can kind of speak to it in more detail, but I'll give them answer questions once they're done with their presentation. Yes, thanks, Norm. That was an excellent intro. My name is Julia Arsaki. I'm a public works engineer. I've been working with many folks in this room to develop these standards. Um, so a brief overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. We'll go over the history of standards in Burlington. Norm hit on that a little bit. Go through the what, why, 
of the standards. Um, we'll talk about a few different examples of both drawings and specifications. And then finally, we'll um, talk, through, talk through this process we've outlined for actually adopting and updating engineering standards. <laughs> So the history largely started in 2011 when the city adopted the transportation master plan. Um, so this is the document that looked at our entire street network and kind of identified what kind of street technologies go on what streets. So that was the high level view of the kind of what um, our street network looks like. Um, in 2012, the city um, had to adopt the VTrans town road and bridge standards. Um, that's what Norm was mentioning. That is what was required for the city to be able to accept grants and FEMA funding. Um, then in 2016, the city through our excavation permit started requiring that any work in the right of way happens to the VTRAN standard specifications for construction. So this is a really long document that VTRANS releases every five to six years of um, construction practices. Um, in 2018, we adopted the Great Streets B2B design standards for downtown. This was a lot more focused on like um, materiality and what we want our downtown to look like in allocation of space within the right of way, but just for downtown. Um, in 2020, we had to adopt an updated version of the VTrans Town Road Inbridge standards as part of that ongoing obligation to except funds from trans. So that's our history. Coming back to the standards that we're bringing to you tonight, um, in a very general sense, what are they? They're a set of drawings and written specifications um, for construction of features that we build in the right of way all the time. So this is like curb, sidewalk, stuff like that. Um, the standards are based on best practices that we've learned over the years working on different water resources and transportation capital projects. Um, we do pull in some great streets components, mainly around um, street ecology and um, trees and making sure we are providing good conditions for our street trees. Um, but then underpinning all of our standards is the VTrans um, standard specifications for construction document that's very holistic. Um, we are just making some modifications for procedures specific to Burlington because we're a whole lot more urban than the rest of the state. We kind of have some more specific um, requirements oftentimes. So who created them? Um, engineers in public works that you're looking at right now. Martin and his team um, provided some for the utilities that they own. We worked with DPW Traffic with Streets, Office of the City Attorney, Parks, who's in charge of the trees and plantings. Um, and then we've also been working with the Office of City Planning and Permitting and Inspections for um, those kind of developer building something in the right of way scenarios that Norm was talking about, and also really interface for like curb cuts and driveways. Access management. Access management. Yep. So the standards, if adopted, will be applicable for anybody doing work in the right of way. So we see this as um, any contractors, developers, or city staff, and is also applicable through our um, zoning ordinance to developers doing work that they'll eventually turn over as right of way to the city and in development so the city. So the big picture of why we have them, I mean, the main thing is that so things are built consistently throughout the right of way and so that we are more prepared to maintain and repair assets throughout the city. Um, another benefit is that it makes um, developing our contract documents more straightforward and helps with making sure we're doing things uniformly across divisions and departments throughout the city, um, which kind of makes a more predictable bidding experience for contractors because they see the same things over and are used to doing things the same way. Um, and then like I've been talking about, we've worked with the Office of City Planning to reference engineering standards 
in our um, comprehensive development ordinance so that developers are held to the same standards. Um, and several communities around Vermont, close ones like Wilson, Essex, and Colchester have already adopted similar kind of municipal engineering standards just because of all of these benefits um, for working the right way. All right, so here is an example of an engineering standard drawing. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever wondered exactly how a sidewalk is built. Um, this is the drawing that explains it. <laughs> it starts with excavation and we have pay limits for that. So if the contractor excavates outside of those paid limits, it's kind of considered like strenuous and not required for construction. So they won't get paid for it. Um, then it comes six inches of dense graded crushed stone subbase um, that has certain like compaction requirements. Um, and then on top of that is the concrete panels that we actually walk on, which is usually five inches thick. Um, you see in the notes over commercial driveways or residential driveways with dumpsters, they're a little thicker, eight inches to withstand that um, heavy, heavier traffic. So this is just one example, and um, I have the website, I'm happy to go through some more, but um, I think the point is they're very technical drawings that um, are things that we're already doing, these are already in practice for our sidewalk um, reconstruction um, contract. Um, this is just formalizing it, making it available online, and also if there's like, so for some reason someone else is building a sidewalk, it'll be built to the standard and we'll know that and it will last. Um, so the other piece of the standards is the written specifications. And like I said, they're primarily focused on, or based on the VTRAN standard specs. Um, we did a couple modifications to Burlington specific scenarios. So for example, in the sub-base section, we've modified it to allow contractors to reuse subbase if it's in good condition under the sidewalk. Um, I've been mentioning the trees, section 656 is all about plantings. We are requiring minimum soil volumes based on um, tree species to make sure uh, street trees can thrive when they're healthy or when they're mature trees. Um, that's been an issue our arborist has brought up multiple times. Um, and then another example in our traffic sign section our traffic crew has repeatedly requested that we only use square tube signs. So VTrans allows a couple different shapes. They just want to be dealing with one throughout the right of way. And some additional examples of specification where we're kind of adding more um, Burlington specific provisions are um, like we added a section about how to close streets to parking temporarily for construction. Um, what to do if you encounter hazardous materials on a construction site, um, requirements for submitting record drawings and GPS data for a lot of our uh, water, stormwater wastewater infrastructure. Um, and then, so finally, the process that we're proposing to adopt and update these standards is that um, we, as the engineers in DPW will bring any new standards to the TUC and seek sponsorship to bring them to the city council to adopt, like we're doing tonight. Um, any big, large scale design policy updates, we would also bring to the TUC um, for sponsorship to the city council to adopt. Um, and that would be, um, as an example, back to our sidewalk here, if we decided instead of having a five foot minimum width, we wanted to go to six foot minimum, that would be a big impact to our right of way. And that would be like a larger discussion that we would come back to the two and city council to have. Um, on the other hand, for smaller kind of best practices for construction and safety updates to our standards, um, we're proposing that the city engineer has the authority to update, um, make those kinds of updates to the drawings and specifications. So one example of that would be adding um, two inches of subbase. So instead of requiring six inches of subbase, we would ask for eight inches of subbase. So those kind of like smaller technical 
changes. We hope to be a little more nimble to kind of keep up with the evolving engineering profession as best practices change over time. So that is my presentation for y'all tonight. Happy to answer the questions. Or so one thing that I think is valuable for council members to see is that this is all available electronically through hyperlinks. Yes. And that's so people can that it's it's intended to be a very live, active, evolving document of detailed specifications that it doesn't just statically place in a book, it's electronically available and continuing to be updated on a YouTube basis. Yep. So this oops, you can't see this. Sorry. I think that's what was likely to ask. Right. So instead of adopting one document, that if we had to go and make a change to one detail on one drawing, having to get the whole thing readopted, um, we're going to hopefully just post revisions of specific drawings and specifications and track the dates that things have been updated and post them um, here on the city's website. In a similar fashion to how we have to date our ordinances, so they're uh, precision specific and not large whole scale, unless they are a large whole scale, and then yes, we would. There's a larger, larger function. Okay. Which is also how VTrans does it. So contractors or anyone who's familiar with these drawings and needs to use them is already used to looking at an online site like this. Eight stamping is important for the purpose of any sort of design process already underway, how it relates to what we're expecting or requiring. So I'll wait because I got of course the questions. But for you, it have good. Anna, do you have uh, comments or questions? Um, I have two. I'm very supportive of this. Um, I'm, I, I was a software engineer by trade, so I like standards and, and conventions around things, and having these makes a lot of sense to me. Um, one of the questions I have is how I, you'll come across circumstances where you may not be able to execute some project to standard. Is there a process by which you can get a variance or an exception to a standard and what might that look like? So uh, built into a lot of our drawings and specifications are for as a group by the engineer. Right. So if there's a situation like that where it's impossible to build right. something a certain way, they would have to confer with the city engineer, public works, and some There's situations that that happens that just not predict all the circumstances of what is the right fit. But you try to have a standard practice that is consistently applied. And if if we see that there's something that is continuously inconsistently or has to be modified or changed, maybe the specification can change as well. So that this this is a great learning tool for us in terms of. What works, what doesn't work, and what needs to be modified and changed. So it's if you don't have the point of reference, how can you improve that kind of that mousetrap? Well, Thank the you. document, the documentation of when those variances happen, and how we talk about how problem. we're going to do that because, like, we find things in the in the field, and we're like, "Ooh, why?" And there probably was a re there in many cases there probably was a reason why it happened, and if somebody can just Right, what that is down, then we don't have to spend any time angsting over what what happened back 50 years ago. And we'll probably always have that. It's just, yeah, but having a place where you could go and this will limit that. Hopefully, limit that. Thank you, and that that that, that is a good answer. Um, my other question, though, is you made the you made the uh, case that some. Uh, changes to specifications or introduction of new specifications would require um at least committee level sort of sign off when some would be up to the discretion of the city engineer and how what's the what are the factors that determine you know whether or not you need one or the other are they at all cost or, I, no. I would I would think that it ties back to trade-offs between different systems and how that impacts those systems and what is the vision of the city is it substantially different than 
what is understood in any sort of any guidance. So one of the things that we've struggled with and it happened even if, through the great street standards is, is to what I had mentioned here in the question originally. You know, what are the variances that are, are working or not working? Um, additionally, just as technology has these great leaps and bounds in its advancements, and then sometimes it goes really slow. If we find ourselves in a time where we change a system or a system changes dramatically, MUCT, MUTCD, who controls signals and signs and striping, comes out with a revision and goes, you shouldn't be doing stop bars this way. They need to be updated. We want the city engineer to have the authority as a safety improvement to just say we're doing it this right now. Yeah, we have um, difficulty. So that's one of the reasons why we listed safety and best practices. Best practices. These are really minor tweaks um, to, to bring our standards in compliance relatively quickly. Doesn't mean that we can't come back to the committee annually and just kind of give a list of these updates that have occurred. That's something that we talked about a lot um, as kind of just a general practice. But it is a little bit of a gut check in the fact that city engineer is appointed and is confirmed, and that you guys would have a little faith in who you are selecting that they can make those good judgments to say. And, and I agree with that. Just you know, I'm not saying that everything <laughs> should come through our committee. I'm just Wondering yeah. what the calculation would be when you were deciding whether or not. Well, I think that that's a challenge until we kind of right. really experience it. Yeah. It's kind of something got uh, under our belt and that may vary between among the different city engineers and their their vision of how it should be and how it should be functioning. But I think we want to be transparent as we can be, but also face a certain reality that there's we have certain obligations that require us to act in that quickly. Standards of practice are really kind of out there. There's not that much that we're going to really depart from the standards of practice. Okay, that's all. That's all I have. But thank you for that. So, if some people in this building know that I had a major lawsuit over the uh, Church Street Marketplace reconstruction with the Don Weston five billion dollar for three. Tons of gravel. So I'm I'm actually pretty familiar. We remember. <laughs> this. I, I'm still I'm still pretty pissed off uh, about that. And we have gone through this with the acceptance of say the the the, the development on uh, Stanford Road and the processes. So I think that this is a very important thing as a general. Um, Frame, as general framework and, and 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 for transparency's sake for everybody, including our own, so that when we do change orders, it's our responsibility to document it. Because when you're asking a lawyer to go after the people for not building the thing the way it is because they breached the contract and we're now holding, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars from them, and they sue you, the, you your lawyers need to have the documentation and that documentation is going to be based on regulation. So I generally um, agree with this uh, wholeheartedly. Um, the zoning, the link with the zoning and the permitting conditions. So if we act now, you know, the, the question I've got has to do with how seamless that process is and the timing of that, because we want to do things between the building codes, the construction work, and the permitting process, so that we adopt this, it's part of the permit conditions. Yep. So what? So zoning's rewrite and effectuation of the ordinance actually happened this month. Is that right? So their their effectuation um, and already acted upon updates in the language came into effect, and it's part of the current. Uh, comprehensive development ordinance in October, as of today. So it's, earlier it, October. it's already been, it, it it, it's had its 21 days. And it references the plan. Okay. Yeah. It references the engineering standards. City and the city council has adopted it. Okay. It's I mean, okay. All right. Good. Okay. So that, that's <laughs> that's one thing because and, and kind of because we don't quite have the standards. Right. Right. Well, that, 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 and that's a reason to act quick to act now. Clearly, so see this point, but we often are like out of sync, so that's good. Um, I think that 
this is great. The explanation makes perfect sense. It would make a lot of sense to have the listing and the rationales for the specific Burlington deviations from B trans or from M U T C. Yeah. You know. Really, we're varying from B trans or creating our own specification. So, so and, and so having on the, the the so it's public facing. This is why we do this. Okay, um, I think it's really important, and and actually calling it out. It's 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 it's, it's and. Believe me, it is important for your attorneys to have an easy way. And it's important for your communications with your attorneys that it's easy for them to find it. So when they're, they don't, you don't have to spend a lot of time in meetings. No, that's them. a great point. Good compliance from everybody and then defensibility will be highlighting to contractors. Absolutely. Where, where the differences from. and the, and the reasons for them, because People want to know, and so the last question relates to the uh, whether there has been a reaction to this by the development community, and what the likelihood of there being increase in uh, construction costs, what the likelihood of my friends in the Champlain Housing Trust and in Cathedral Square to start to scream about how this is making, you know, housing more unaffordable. And um, here we are on the state level, we've just missed our target. And now all of a sudden, you're, you know, you're doing these things. And let me say that I, like I said, I wholeheartedly support people building to standards. I think there are lots of varying ways to vary us, but I think it would be helpful for that community to understand what you're doing, for them to buy that in, and where there are uh, there are going to be increased costs associated with front end, end. what front end costs. well and 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 no, actually right. back end costs. And, and and private costs as opposed to the public costs right because often what happens is the public ends up subsidizing that's what you were saying i've seen it you know the you know air, you know the shoddy construction right or the you know the the cheaper construction if not shoddy the more affordable however you want to characterize it and all those probably all of those um less and, durable the less durable so it breaks down instead of like your your treatment plants it just breaks down that much quicker and then we and then we have accepted it and all of a sudden it's on our dime and we've got to come up with it. The broader factors. Exactly. That's what I mean by our diet. So, so to, I was just going to say that, that that would mean at least in terms of housing development. That's, I think, one of the reasons why we've got a, a housing trust fund to make things more affordable. So if there is a pushback from the house, you know, then the conversation with the, with CEDO and Brian related to that so that if we are going to lessen the standards on the front end because uh, they are going to it's going to make a project meet the affordability needs that we want then what we want to do it seems to me is on the front end be directly saying we're going to subsidize for that because that's where we're going to get it. We're not going to let you do this on the sly underneath. You know, we're going to do it because just like we tax affordable housing differently because the statute says that's the way we do it. Then when we're going to do it for engineering standards, we're going to figure out a process by which we're going to, as a community, say, yeah, we'll, we'll help you do that. And I'm all for that. Like still meet the standard, but give them money to them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, we're, we're not playing this game and nobody knows and we get, <laughs> and the values get all mixed up and what ends up happening is the rich get richer. And I will stop. I'll jump <laughs> off that little step. Well, so just if I can speak to that quickly, um, one of the things that's been here since I've been at the city nine years is there are technical review committees for learning developments that the 
uh, zoning on administrators post interdepartmentally. Um, and generally, each department has had the opportunity to review these larger developers' uh, developments, plans, um, to determine what standards that they're constructing things through. And so that's definitely something that's been helpful in the most recent years that we are already looking at their plans and their technical details and making suggestions for best practices. So the incremental cost to go up to what is already a pretty minimal standard, which is V-Trans, and while we have some nuances for Burlington, they're not gold-plated, they're not even grant-plated. Um, and so they're not really asking for a lot, but they're asking for developers that are not used to doing this, and maybe they're using their cousin to construct their sidewalk, but they're not putting down a thin layer that looks like a great piece of sidewalk that breaks in two years, and that people are tripping over because it just wasn't constructed well. Um, we're going to struggle more with those types of um, smaller outfits than I think we are the larger ones because we've really already been having these conversations. But you bring up a great point. Um, I don't think we had CEDO on our coordination list, and so we can bring that to CEDO before bringing this to the council so we have the full communication. Right. I would say a lot of the kind of departures from P Transit the Federal Highway is that those are highway standards of practice for an urban environment. So we have to have an overlay to that that represents more urban interests. I'm yeah. totally supportive. I think that the rationales they are a pain because we you know there's their work they have to, to delay that amount. They're but in the long run, the educated uh, people is really an advantage. So I, I think this is great. I would, I would have liked for us to have this. So there's a motion uh, in the memo. Um, so I would be uh, willing, as I just moved to the, uh, to, to make the motion that is in the me memo um, with the um, addition that uh, staff also consult with CEDO related to the, um, uh, affordability question and that they make sure that the Burlington specific uh, deviations are listed and rationales are provided somewhere in the, the framework. I would second that. Is you sufficiently cap whoever's, whoever's capturing? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other discussion? I'll just, I'll just say one one thing about that just to riff on something that Jean said is that if there are like if there is pushback then we can have the conversation about the standard and either justify it or or modify it or whatever is put our justification or not and then kind of subsidize it somehow. So so I think that'll be it'll be good a good mechanism to bring those things to the forefront. Um, so any no other discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So that, that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I I joined the city in 2009 yeah, we, and you were talking about it. So yeah, like this has <laughs> been on our <laughs> annual work of science since I got here. So you still have to convince the rest of the council. You've got the pushovers here too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, this is progress. Uh -huh. Isn't it going up set? We have a uh, we have ten minutes in item for our remaining items. Great. We have uh, then the next moving on. Thank you, thank you for that. That was a uh, that was a good discussion. Um, next is our bike share update, and I know we're having a full update next month. So this was requested last month to try to address some of the. Uh, some of the issues that uh, the community had brought, or even Andrea, who came to spoke today, um, had brought to council or so. Sure. So I, uh, Katie was online. I guess she may not be anymore. But um, as Chapin has mentioned, um, we're planning to bring Bird and Katma to the two in November for a much more comprehensive presentation and update about the current status of Bird. Um, they did have some uh, very preliminary results from kind of their first quarters of operation. Um, it was showing a lot of trips were under 10 minutes and about two miles long, which we were interpreting as for the purpose-driven trips versus um, just kind of the leisurely recreation ones. Uh, so we see that as a positive. We see 
the bike share system is functioning and serving a transportation. Um, there's been so much discussion about where and how bird bikes are parked. And as a resident myself, I see that and understand that issue. Um, so bird has, and has always had a community mode in their app. Um, if they don't know about the issue, they really can't respond to it. Um, so if bikes are not reported as parked incorrectly, they won't know about it and they can't fix it. They have gotten 77 reports through their app, um, all of which they've responded to within two hours of um, improperly parked bikes. Um, they also have a Vermont 301 at bird.co email that you can report bikes or anything um, to bird that way. Um, and I, I don't think it's been as heavily used based on what we're hearing from Catma, but it's another channel that they um, can talk to. And then I think on a broader scale of educating and outreach for bird bike users, um, bird is really trying to do more community outreach through the app, through messaging about how to park bikes, how they're not supposed to be blocking the sidewalk. Um, they're also looking into a program for kind of like repeat offenders. Of if so, someone parks a bike incorrectly multiple times and it gets reported through the app, um, they will um, first send a message to that person and kind of a warning, like, hey, you can't park bike this way, you can't use our bike share if you keep doing that. Um, and then eventually they will relinquish the membership of that person if it is a continuing issue. Um, so that's kind of the high level update from Bird and Katma for this month. And then I think next month will be the, the more in depth presentation from them. Thanks. Um, questions? I don't want to have time anything. Excuse me. That's it. I was wondering if Adam. Yeah. Adam, do you have questions? Um, I'm going to wait until next month after the more in depth overview. Uh, I'm not happy with relying on the complaint fix to relying on just people complaining on and they're out. So the system that they've got, I think, is inadequate. So I, I want them to know that, that at least one of them were here. It's not, that's, that's a recipe for continued failure. And as the snow flies, you have to plow the, you know, plow the sidewalks. That's another update. Sorry, I forgot. Um, we just heard that the winter plan is that bikes will leave the streets from late December to mid March at least and won't be available in those as they will hibernate or migrate. So that, that's helpful. And I would just like for that bigger report of uh, more. Um, data on the users, uh, where they are, uh, you know, uh, they're the discount program, um, its relationship to the TDM requirements that we've got um, under our new um, zoning ordinance that we passed. Yeah, that's it. I had a question about this feedback mechanism. So if I'm not a bird bike user, although I'm, I want to use one just so I know. I haven't yet. But if I was to get the app, I could then use the app almost like C-Click Fix. And if I saw a bike, I could go around and sort of identify the bike, report the issue. So that that's, that I agree that it's not or, obvious. Or send the email. Or send the email. Yeah, you don't have but, to have the app to report. But a lot of times you're just you're you're driving along and you see a bike in a place where it ought not be. And you want to like if I'm if I'm C click, I use C click fix like that all the time. Yeah. I, I drive in C click fix sometimes even. <laughs> um, which is probably <laughs> probably uh, it's probably the theory is the best. I didn't that. So you're good. Yeah. But um but I would I think that would be helpful because a lot of times it's you know you see it, you or upset by it, and then you forget about it because you're on to the next step. <clears throat> so um, to get that more widely known, I think would be helpful. But also the email is another way. 
but there's maybe a phone number or something that can be called, you know, as well. All of yes, all of those, but I, you know, I, they, I think they need to be out, you know, doing periodic driving around the city, tending to it themselves. Actively looking, actively looking for it, not just waiting for me to, you know, to complain about it. It's totally not my place in this whole thing, but I actually agree with that. I sit on the accessibility committee for DPW for DPW's interest, and they are talking about this every month. Um, and I honestly think while the bikes are heavy, I feel like some of them probably look like they're parked fine, and so they're approved in the app as being parked. And then a stronger human comes out and says, I don't want this on my lawn, or I don't want this on my green belt that I maintain. And they shift it. They shift it a foot, just reasonable enough for an able-bodied human, and then all of a sudden it's parked wrong. And so it's not Bird's fault, it's not the user's fault, it ends up being the neighbor's fault, and now everybody's actually struggling um, with it. I think that there is some of that transientness that's happening in that regard, that if you're not actively patrolling it, you're not seeing it. Okay. Observation. Uh, is there any other discussion this month uh, about that? And I guess are we going to try to communicate uh, some of the discussion here to Cabinet and Bird for next month? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, so if there is no objection, we'll close that item out. We'll move on to our last item. Which is the vehicle for higher modernization. Um, and so I have been continuing to attend the vehicle for hire meetings at their request. Um, and they're doing a great job. Bless you. They're doing a great job. And and as you may or may not have noticed, um, they had a memo of recommendations um, that they was passed on not the last council agenda, but the one before that on consent. Um, and they've started taking these up. And last week, they actually approved an update to the rate structure, which was one of the recommendations in the memo. Um, so with some notice and some other um, gyrations at the city staff level, these will get rolled out over the next 60 to 100 days. It's not clear to me exactly how long it will take, but hopefully by the end of the year. Um, one of the recommendations, however, I wanted to bring up in this meeting, um, and I and it's the one about modernization of the metering system. Um, they made a recommendation as a board that we explore new, more modern ways to do taxi meters than the mid-century electromechanical boxes that are in the cabs now um, that need to be updated by some guy that lives in Albany or something. So it's like there, um, there's a number of reasons to do it, but there are also just the maintainability is one of them. Um, and so the chair of that committee, Paul Hines, has talked with Scott Barker about this, but what I would like our committee to do, if, if people are inclined, is to formalize the request to um, the innovation and technology department so that they can do that work and come back to us with some recommendations on how to move forward. If it's more than 50,000, I think we need an RFP. Um, you know, there may be, uh, I talked to Catherine Chad about it. There may be budgetary considerations here. We're going into budgeting season. So I'd like to start that work, let Scott's department start that work. Um, and then have them bring recommendations back to our committee that then we could then further act on and bring a recommendation to the full city council. So that was that's the, the desire of this item. And so with that said, I'll open it up for discussion or a motion. And I, I sent a motion to yeah. the two uh, committee members. I have no discussion. If Anna has any, I'd love to hear it. Otherwise, I move to um, approve your motion. Okay. And I would second that. Okay, and would the did I sent the motion to I believe I copied. Uh, I have. I yes. have the motion, so I can put that in a minute. So. Okay. Very good. Is there any other discussion? I guess seeing none. Um, all those in favor of the motion. Aye. And so that passes, and um, we'll have that passed along to Scott Barker's um, 
department. Um, so that brings us to our next slide, which is the director's report. Great, I have two quick items uh, given the hour and wanting to achieve the uh, chair's goal of getting up at seven o'clock. Uh, the first is wanted to give you a heads up that uh, staff are working on uh, potential rate changes for uh, parking, uh, predominantly in this first phase for off street parking. Uh, we have uh, two different funds in on street uh, parking, uh, excuse me, traffic fund that is funded largely from meters on street, and then a parking facilities fund, which is funded by garages and lots. Um, as folks may know, uh, we embarked on significant overhauls to our garages. We've made millions of dollars of repair of these aging facilities. COVID hit, took away our fund balance. And uh, frankly, we uh, are needing to ensure revenue that is sufficient to operate the facilities and to pay that service. So we are looking at a suite of changes. The rates in the garages and lots have not been changed for many years. Uh, so we will be coming to the commission probably in November. Starting that conversation, there's a partner conversation about on-street adjustments, especially as we're discussing Main Street, Great Streets during the construction phase and how we're gonna help balance traffic so while this discussion goes predominantly to the commission, given the um, you know stakeholder interest in this issue, we wanted to make sure that we brought this topic to your attention. Happy to engage you in ways that you think are appropriate moving forward, but likely a number of these recommendations will be hitting the commission uh, November 16th, I believe is the, the meeting for November. Um, and the second thing is that we are working uh, to uh, bring forward a contract acceptance for Main Street, Great Streets for that project. Uh, as you're familiar, it's a TIF, largely a TIF funded project. Uh, we are working to bring the revenues and expenses into alignment. Uh, bids came in high and we are working uh, to value engineer, identify additional funding resources and bring you a project that we'll be seeking the council's approval, uh, hopefully Board of Finance on 13th and council approval on 20th. Those are the two updates, Norm, anything I forgot? Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, council updates. Council updates? I, not an update, but I have a report okay. that um, we have a list of the items that are you know that have been asked for us to deal with whether we get to them or not but they'll just be part of the you know, the board pack you know the, the committee packet so that we can uh know what's out there or what needs to be done and can then yeah. prioritize thank you thank you we'll make sure that we have that uh along the next one i can't find my huge list um, well, we have. Uh, a, I know you do. We have <laughs> it's much easier for me to go and done the deal with it now. It's, it's usually called the tooth list, but now it's just the gene. Uh, list. I, I'd be happy for Hannah and Mark to add to that <laughs> list, uh, but you know, they, it's all good. Um, so I'll make sure we have that for next time. Yep. Hannah, do you have any updates? Okay. Um, and I don't either. I had one uh, sidewalk thing, which I will take offline um, and not have as part of this meeting. So with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And, uh, and the discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 How about that? Pretty good. <laughs> good. Uh, all right.